Thank you guys for joining me for special needs homeschool tips. You will see me in the chat area as Chris Accardo, but my name is Leah Flippin. I'm one of the reference librarians here at Weatherford Public Library. I'm a homeschool mom, and I do have a special needs child that I have homeschooled all the way through. First thing I wanted to talk about was if you're part, if you are a parent homeschooling for the first time this year, you may also enjoy a homeschool 101 webinar. Uh, today, I even saw an article discussing the difficulties that special needs students are having right now receiving therapy and other services during the COVID-19. So I hope that this presentation can give you guys some ideas and some helpful tips to kind of fill in some of those uh, needs. So this presentation, we're going to focus on children with intellectual and, intellectual and behavior disabilities. Cognitive impairments is most of this, but I am going to cover some other things. So if you're looking for some information on, uh, let's see, for dyslexia and dysgraphia, I've got some resources here as well. I am, this is primarily going to focus on though kids on that are on autism spectrum disorder or Down syndrome, fragile X, those with developmental delays, or they have some type of mental retardation. Um, that's kind of what I have more knowledge of. Uh, but I do have some, uh, I have worked some with uh, dyslexia issues, so if you would like to know more, I'm just going to start out right here with some of these basics. Uh, if you are looking for some complete curriculum suggestions, you may want to consider some of these. There's a Teach Town curriculum. And so there's Teach Town. It's popular supplemental curriculum. It does a lot of things on social, social needs. And then simply classical. I'm going to get, get the swing of this, guys. So just be there with me. Uh, simply classical curriculum, if you have not heard of this curriculum, actually has a great uh, scripted curriculum for a special needs child. If they are ready to do real school, this is a slower track, but with scripted words, so it's really helpful for the teaching parent, especially if you enjoy uh, classical style education or even Charlotte Mason. Brain integration, if you've ever heard of this, it's uh, children who are more trained learn how to process the world a little better. Another company that does that, I did not list here, a similar type program is the Little Giant Steps. And I'm just going through general curriculum right now uh, because I just want to give you guys some resources to start with. Um, free resources online. To learn has great uh, for disabilities. Um, there's things you can print out for free, lots and lots of things like uh, visual schedules and such. And speaking of visual schedules, here's some free pictures. Uh, you can download this software, which is uh, visual images, pictures, Exchange education system and completely free. And then there's a special needs teacher site. This is does give options for uh, American versions of their documents. And then Trainland, if you already do, if you already have a board maker. You already have a uh, You also can use um, these pics, pictures icons. Some of them you need word maker run, others not so much. A discrete trial trainer. This is a software that I actually use with my autistic son, and uh, he used it a lot in the very beginning. And if you know what discrete trial training is, it's a format of um, how to teach to the special needs child. It's normally used in an ABA setting. If you apply behavior analysis, 
uh, and Touch Math now has homeschool kits. And this is a really neat way for kids who are struggling with math skills uh, that they can use this Touch Math process. And you can use it with any type of, pro, uh, of actual worksheets. They just make it easier up front, up front for you to have um, pre-made materials. Uh, this Autism and PDD, we've used some of these products. We really like Matt and Molly. Matt and Molly are some fun stories to teach social skills. And so like Matt and Molly down here. Is that a, um, where is it? Right in here, I think there's some Matt and Molly's down further. And then the Buddy Bears, when it was really, really little, we liked the Buddy Bear software. And these are free. Some of them are free, some are just like a dollar or two. Free for all special needs kids. Um, lots of hands on folders and contacted books, uh, using real photos. This is a really good site that's inexpensive. And I'm not going to go through everything. All of these links because it's just going to be a lot of information. I this this presentation, this PowerPoint will be available to you uh, on our Homeschool Resources web, web page, and you can click on all the links you want. Uh, but for now, let me just do an overview of what I've I've got for dyslexia and dysgraphia down here. If you go to our Homeschool Resources web page, this is the library's Homeschool Resource web page. We have a, a the special needs. If you click on this orange box, that's going to send you to items in the collection that we have for you to check out. And then down here, we have it grouped into categories. So, like if we're looking for materials for dyslexia, these are some free resources or very low cost resources that can, can help you with your special needs child or, or learning disabled. Uh, All About Learning uses tiles in the Orton-Gillingham approach to teach phonics and um, reading. It's really great for uh, dyslexia or kids that are struggling with understanding all the rules about phonics. And Logic of English, same thing. A sequential spelling uh, is actually good for any of the kids, but it is based on information for uh, those who are dyslexic. Uh, you can also look at some things that work that emphasize syllable work. And I wanted to just make sure that you understood that if you need, if you're teaching a child with sex and dysgraphia, you definitely want to use phonics based instruction. Later on, I'll be doing sight word based learning, but you do not want to do that for dyslexic students. Okay, they need to have a good phonics foundation. Okay, and here's some library books that you'll find in the collection that are helpful. Um, some programs that are available for higher function students to consider. Uh, for learning is a great one that's only like $20 a month. For the older child who needs a little bit of accommodation. So this is a good one if you're wanting to do distance learning. A, this, that's a good curriculum for that as an alternative. Okay, now that out of the way, let's let's talk about what we can do ourselves at home. Okay, so let's go into general considerations. What are your educational goals? Okay, this could be like an individualized uh, you know, education plan. Um, or some other type of plan that you put together and what level of mastery are you requiring for your child? We also want to think about what is your goal's purpose and is it meaningful to your child? Is it useful for daily life outside of, I call it table time, or your one-on-one -on -one teaching with your child? What is their ability level in each focus area? What methods work best for them? Can your child handle some tasks independently that is 
follow a schedule, use a choice board? Do they have a picture exchange system? Or do they use an online virtual school service? What motivates your child to work? Um, how long can your child stay on task? And how many repetitions of a goal is considered mastery? So these are all general considerations we want to take, in, take into consideration so that we can uh, know what we want to do uh, with the program that we're preparing for our child. Next is talking about some things. Now, I, if it seems a little heavy-handed towards autism, I'm sorry. I just that's mo what I'm most familiar with. I know there's a lot of kids on the spectrum out there, but there are a lot of things that relate to them that I think other people can find helpful. So, first of all, one of the biggest issues that that I deal with with my son is his stimming issues. So, what is a stim? Okay, the most a stim is an obsessive adherence. Okay, so it's like a repetitive behavior, okay? So usually what, in most situations, uh, like uh, some studies like ABA practices, applied behavior analysis, the most common response of obsessive adherence to routine and repetitive behavior, like stimming, is to avoid or to stop the behavior, okay? But there, there's also another theory that sees these as isms, okay? So stimming versus isms. Uh, they think uh, the other third train of thought is that an ism is a cue that your child is overloaded and not ready to learn. So a red light. Um, it's approached as a pathway to communicate by joining in with your child. And then under this perspective, repetitive solitary behaviors are viewed as a coping mechanism and can help the child make sense of the world and calm down, focus or enjoy an interest. But uh, it's time to intervene, though, when it becomes harmful to the child, destructive, disturbs others, or interferes with their learning or the quality of life. And so transitions are difficult for special needs children, so be patient and expect that there will be frustration. Um, be prepared ahead of time for minor interruptions that deviate from the controlled environment of a classroom to the natural setting of a home. So here are some situations. Here are some things to help you with these types of behaviors. Uh, you could create a choice board. Sorry, guys. A choice board. Uh, you could prepare multiple schedules, not just one, but multiple schedules, so that those can be interchanged eventually. Uh, you have an A schedule and a B schedule, and then that way they're not so controlled by the schedule. Uh, and uh, don't get so upset when things change. Uh, you can also have independent activities prepared ahead of time. Uh, be sure to, so that they can be easy to grab quickly and the student, and something that the kid, that the, their child enjoys. So they can work on it independently in case you have to attend to something or you get pulled away. Uh, you could teach your child to use a timer. So. Uh, you can, once you teach them to use a timer, they can have timed activities they can do, similar to the others. And then you can substitute or replace with a, a, a stimming behavior with a similar action that is more natural and appropriate, so a replacement uh, behavior. So uh, you might want to change, here are ways you could do it. You could do uh, limit the time the behavior is allowed if it seems to be having a common effect. Wait until they're ready to pay attention before you transition back to learning, okay? And you want something that's a similar action. So like if they're mad and they're hitting their, their hand on their knee, which is bruising their leg, instead have them stomp their foot. So if that gives you an idea. So think ahead and plan by anticipating that you will have these uh, routine issues, stems versus isms, and unexpected interruptions. All right, so here are some advantages to teaching at home. You're going to have fewer stress and distractions in the home environment. You'll be able to individualize education and modif modify the curriculum for your child specific learning needs. Uh, it can teach appropriate socialization because parents and siblings, hopefully, can be modeled. 
And you can have a flexible schedule that allows for frequent breaks and therapy sessions. Another thing to consider is uh, safety and health. So away from dangerous situations, medical issues, bullies. Uh, you can focus on the child's strengths and interest in their practical life skills. So a little more natural home, natural environment for those learning opportunities. And some more opportunities for hands-on learning and exercise. Exercise is helpful. As well as the hands-on learning. So whenever we want to, uh, whenever we're helping our child work through a working session, you want to praise the child's correct responses. Pair it with a positive reward. So uh, you can you can pair, pair positive praise with the reward. So um, I know in the past uh, they used food items. I'm not sure that that's just the best, but it is the most the strongest response. So in the beginning, gummy bears paired with good job. And then you can fade out the reward in the future and the positive praise statement will become the reward. So you should be able to fade that out a little bit and then bring that back in. And then discrete trial training. Okay, are you guys having some questions? Because I noticed there was a couple people that walked out. Let me take a look at the chat area again. Okay. Okay. Everything looks okay. Okay. Use your principles of, of, F, of ABA, the applied behavior analysis, when you're teaching a child on the spectrum or other kids with you know, cognitive impairments. So let's say we want to do discrete trial training. I mentioned that before, and I'll walk through what exactly how that works in just a little bit. And then create a visual schedule. You could find an ABA consultant or practice that can assist you in creating an at-home program. When we used an ABA consultant, we have also had an education consultant, uh, and they developed a program for us to implement ourselves at home, which is a much less expensive program. So they basically tutored us to do the program ourselves and then we they checked us every month to see if we were on track you can collect data you'll need to do that so that you know if there's progress happening and then track the behavior using a reward use a reward system some type of, of, of reward system and when you're collecting data what you're recording is incorrect responses correct responses if you had to prompt the child if the goal is mastered and you can decide what the mastery level is. Like uh, in, in our instance, we were doing five or more correct responses that were in a row. So uh, another option for this is to backward chain. If you've ever heard of backward chaining, what it is is you're reversing the steps. So instead of teaching um, like how to go to the restroom in, a, in order, then you go from reverse. You go from the end of it and backwards. For some reason, some kids retain it better in reverse and then move it forward in their mind. Uh, and then, so then uh, there's also spiral review. So spiral review that is when the child can replicate a correct response when there is a return to a goal that has been considered mastered in the past. So you're kind of reviewing what you think that they've mastered just to make sure they really have at a later point. Library books, the parent's guide to, to in-home ABA programs. So if you're going to use an ABA program, that that is highly recommended for especially kids that are autistic, but it's it's helpful for all special needs childs or those with, with disabilities. And positive parenting for, for autism. Some other books that we started out and we did this AB, ABLES test. It kind of gives you an idea of where your child stands and what they need to work on, what their strengths and their weaknesses are. And then you can create a verbal uh, a verbal behavior map where you work on how to teach them language and um, social skills. So there's some other options down there as well. Uh, unit one, which is rewards and boards. The before we were just just an overview. So now we're going into rewards and boards. It's important that special needs kids get so we understand the value of a reward 
And so you can start out with, if there's different ways to do rewards, you can do a one-to-one -one reward. We've talked about the healthy snacks, coins, tokens, you can use, uh, you know, paper bills, stickers, etc. So whatever is your child likes and responds to well. So, uh, and also one-to-one -one correspondence is a basic math concept. So that's also something that can help them later in math skills. Uh, you could do pieces of a puzzle. So, uh, or even like uh, we did at one point, he had a favorite video and we would uh, made a Xerox copy of it and cut it up into pieces and then he'd get pieces of it. And then at the end, when he got the whole thing put together, he could watch his movie. So favorite activities with defined endings. So that uh, a natural or contrived. So um, for example, you can have directions or imitation cards. Uh, if you're building something, you could have a picture of it and then they just imitate it directly. Or you could have a, a very step-by-step uh, -step instructions uh, with pictures on how to do it. You could listen or read a book. And close-ended means there's a defined end, okay? So just want to make sure you understand the difference. And then uh, physical encouragement. You can use high fives, clapping, fist bump, tickles, hugs paired with a praise statement. Uh, we talked about it. We talked about including that praise statement. And then you, they could get, they could do something that they like, like get a snack or a drink. A time reward is an open-ended situation so you have to put a timer on it so they know when it ends so uh, for movie or tv time you want to set a limit uh, it's going to be computer time an open-ended favorite activity uh, jumping on the trampoline listen to music uh, take a break they could go to a common sensory area uh, they could have some exercise time outside to play or swing so those are ways that we can do rewards. Okay, and then now we're going to talk about systems. How do we implement the, these so that they can understand? Um, ruler system is the most basic. Basically, you have a ruler and you move it forward for hard work and make small moves forward for easy answers until you get to the end where the end at the tail end of the ruler is the prize. We could do the complete the puzzle, which I mentioned before. Uh, and then one piece could be a correct answer, or you can get multiple pieces if they work really hard at something. And then you can see here of a token economy, which is a popular one. I'm working for, and then you put the prize there, and then looks like we got to get, what was it, 10? No, 12, 12 correct answers before they can get their prize there. So those are working for boards. And then the simple one-to-one -one correspondence is useful for a completed challenging task to get a desired task or reward. So this is really simple. First you do this, then you get that. So it can be used to, to delay gratification for an activity. Uh, you can also use it for lowering stress of what happens next. So some kids are not sure what's going to happen next, and this can reduce their stress levels. Schedule for a task board. Okay, so here, these are these are schedules and task boards. So we've got a schedule this way, where you just have their different activities. And I'm sure that most of you parents are doing this already, but just an overview for those who may not have been doing a lot of this at home. I'm sure they're if they're at school, then this they're doing a lot of these schedules. Uh, here's one that's on just a keychain, and they just thumb through it. Here's a here's a ruler system. We talked about a ruler system before. Here's uh, one with the visuals actual actually there. And here's a choice board, so they get to pick which one of these activities they want to do. Uh, and here's another version of a choice board, and um, or here. So there's lots of ways you can make these boards. Do what works for your kid. Okay. And then here's some behavior boards. We talked about red light or green light. This is when your kid's doing happy things or things that they enjoy or they're ready to learn. Uh, 
These are things when that are bad choices and they're not ready to learn and they're not doing uh, things you don't want them doing. So and that's one way to do that. And then there's the feelings thermometer. So we've got the, the very happy here to very mad. You do, once you start getting into this area, you want to start thinking about what you need to do to keep them from getting to the red. So, um, so the behavior board's op options are some children can use boards that help behavior. Others may need more guidance. You can also modify the, the, the previous board formats to focus on a behavior milestones rather than activities. Anticipate the behaviors. Keep them from getting to uh, that red area. At that point, they're, you know, they're really upset. Um, no ways to calm down and manage if you could not avoid the behavior. Um, you can use a web diagram with choices for calming. Remember uh, the ABCs of behavior. ABC of behavior is antecedent behavior and consequence. So what sometimes a child responds has a behavior that isn't necessarily from something that happened before, but it could also be something that happens after, and that's what a consequence is. So if they're in anticipation of something that they don't really want to do, that can cause a behavior. And so you're trying to look at all those things to get data collection so you can determine what caused the problem. And then uh, red versus green, yes versus no, go versus stop choices. We talked about that. Okay, next on to, now these next two sections are going to be where the bulk of the presentation is going to be. We're going to talk about language development and learning to read when you cannot learn phonics. To match vocabulary, you're going to place the desired object of children out of reach. Name and see if the child retrieves when asked to get it, or request the items by speaking or handing you a picture of the item. Just so you know, if you need a little more help on seeing how that works, this YouTube video of ABA Practices, if you click on that link and go to YouTube, uh, there are several, several ABA practice videos on there, and it will show you how discrete trial training up above is used to learn vocabulary and learning to read and various things that you can do. So it's a really good resource. You want, you want to encourage your child to use language as much as possible. So try to encourage them to use language and not respond unless they're using words. A uh, child matches identical objects and pictures. Uh, name objects or pictures as you present new vocabulary to your child. Have them repeat it back. Expand to a matching or lotto game as a learning game for vocabulary development. And start including the words of the pictures. This will transition to reading language. So as it says there, we're going to go to site-based reading later and discuss more about how this works. But uh, some products that you may need for that are things like picture cards, uh, language cards, um, these down here. This is, a, I believe, a, a WH uh, questions. Uh, and then there's some that are like uh, vocabulary words to objects. Uh, so there's lots of different things you can use as resources uh, without spending a whole lot of money. In fact, you can make your, your own with photographic cards. Uh, and so if you make your own, you can have, make as many duplicates as you want. It relates to the child best because it's something they're familiar with. Up here, discrete trial training. Just, this is just a basic overview of how discrete trial training works. First, you start out, and, and I'm, uh, you start out with two cards. And one is very strong and one isn't. One is a very obvious and correct choice. So you start out that way. And you ask your, child, ask your child to select the answer. Then you give a little delay, but prompt if, if you need to, rather than let them make a mistake. You want it to be errorless teaching. So uh, you tap on it, or you point to it, or you even like you can even prompt their hand to touch it. Uh, if a child is able, encourage them to speak the word. Um, always model by naming the object or picture that is correct. So you say you tap on it, apple. Make it more difficult by increasing similarities like category, color, shape, size, or texture. 
you can also so you can have like the the correct answer really big and then you can have a, a, a card or even two card two other cards that are smaller sized uh, so that, um, that that goes to the next step which is move from two to three choices and prompt if necessary you can um, either physically um, physically or was it? I don't know why, but that model, you can physically model the correct answer if you need to. Record results until mastery of concept. Okay, so other important considerations are to concentrate on vocabulary and language phrases that have meaning, purpose, and functionality for your child. So you, when you're working on a, creating a vocabulary list and a language list and a sight words list and all those different things, you want it to be words that will be, uh, have meaning to them and help them function better because it will be useful to them. Uh, match match photos or post-it notes in the future. So you can match photos to objects in your child's environment, make duplicates. They can you can put post-it notes in the house around the house with the word and then they can take the picture, the correct picture and and uh, you know match it to it. Another option is you could create a checkoff list of photos to walk around with like a little, like a checkboard and they can just check off this is that they found the right photo or the right word. Use environmental print activities. Environmental print is anything in their, you know, in their environment. It could be something inside the home, but it could also be things like a McDonald's sign uh, or the grocery store, their favorite grocery store or uh, your favorite, their favorite uh, foods or fruits, so things that would be in the environment. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, you taking your own photographic images of familiar items are great for communication work. Okay, so we're going to go through, this is some more curriculum for, for purchase, but this is specific for, um, this one is pretty much a specific for autism right here, because uh, we've got autism curriculum, cyclopedia, uh, attainment with the different types of products that they have, board maker, uh, diff learn again, uh, stages learning, which is the ones that have like, they have the objects that match with the picture cards, the star program, which is a full curriculum for autism, Laureate learning software can be used for any special needs child. It works really, it works a lot on language, uh, verb usage, um, recognizing phrases and etc. And then uh, pro, pro ed, if you want to learn site based reading, uh, Edmark reading program is a really good one. And then uh, there are some apps down here too. If you take a look at that, uh, the best apps there are for special needs children, if that's something you like to use. My son particularly does need care about apps for some reason. He he might do one for three or four minutes and that's it. That's his limit. So uh, not every child uh, not every child enjoys that as a supplement, but uh, lots of kids do. So I wanted to put those on there for you guys. And then for the library books, all these here we have at the library. As you can see, I will tell you that the Autism Language uh, Launcher, Autism Language Launcher was really good. I, I enjoyed that book because it it moves you from two or three words to communicating in, in sentences. This is a brand new one just got in, Autism and Lockdown. So if you're dealing with those kinds of issues, that would be a great one. Uh, and then there's also an IP guide for us, as this was a learning disabilities one, but we have a regular one too for all special needs. And then uh, now this, these are some curriculums that I've enjoyed. Probably my favorite one on here is the pyramid approach to autism and I also like teach. Um, the teach me language is if your child's already speaking pretty well, uh, but if you want to go through that one, that's, I've, I've always heard that was a good one. Okay, let's talk about how to communicate. Some of the things that the kids that are special needs, uh, they have difficulty knowing when and how to communicate with people in socially appropriate ways. For example, they may not make eye contact or let another person take a turn in conversation. Uh, to communicate effectively, children need to 
understand what people say to them. That's called receptive language. Express themselves using words and gest gestures, which is expressive language. And use the receptive and expressive language skills in socially appropriate ways. So, uh, so some of the things that I've dealt with is articulation, which is clarity of speech. Uh, you can use a special uh, a speech language pathologist to help you with that. There are also some um, ways that you can work on that at home yourself, and uh, using either materials that you can get, at, like for example, Super Duper Ink is a good, is a good resource for that, um, or just following things, uh, working on those particular areas that they're not strong in. That that language launcher book also covered those types of issues. Echolalia, repeat or imitate speech. Okay, uh, my son definitely has echolalia. He repeats or imitates the speech. He still does it, even to this day. It could be something from a video. It could be just repeating back to you what you say. Um, sometimes that's how they process, so they're imitating in order to tell themselves. It helps them remember it better and, and realize it better. Uh, and you can use that actually to help spur on language. And uh, nonverbal communication, eye contact, facial expression, and gestures. So uh, that's, that's something that some kids need to work on more than others. A man versus attacked. Okay, that basically means a request versus a comment. For kids, especially on the autism spectrum, requesting is pretty easy. It's venturing into the commenting, naming uh, area that is difficult. Uh, they get something out of a request, but for commenting just, hey, there's a green tree over there, that they don't really see a purpose in the language for that, so it's something they have to really work on. And uh, some kids do not ever bridge that gap, but, um, but that is a very challenging area. Introverbal. WH questions, being able to take, have a conversation and talking about something that is not actually visually present. So those, those are introverbal issues. Receptive language. The ability to understand, follow directions, and listen to stories. Uh, so it's like reading comprehension, um, how to respond to questions, and uh, expressive language is the use of words, sentences, gestures, and writing to communicate with others. And then in pragmatic speech, uh, appropriate communication in social situations. Again, not every child would have issues with all of those areas but uh, those are the kinds that can really hinder communication. Uh, hypotonia is low muscle tone that affects speech production and articulation. Childhood apraxia of speech is a motor disorder that makes it difficult to translate thinking language into spoken language. And if you have a child with Down syndrome, uh, receptive is stronger than expressive and they understand more than they can communicate. They may have oral, oral motor weaknesses and they use shorter sentences and have difficulties with grammar, tenses, and word endings. In autism, uh, they have uh, will have decoding difficulty with what sounds mean and, and matching to words. They may have expressive dysphasia, uh, especially with word order, word endings, and pronouns. So things are switched around. Um, Nonverbal expression like eye contact, appropriate facial expressions and gestures. Uh, they may have assess obsessive topic-based conversations, so they're just focused on one thing, uh, and then it's hard to redirect them. Language may not be appropriate for their age level. It could be either too high or too low. Uh, echolalia is a repeating vocalizations, uh, so maybe it's not just that they echo back phrases, but they also make a bunch of sounds that to you don't make sense. Uh, pronoun reversals, difficulty transitioning from requesting to descriptive language. There's that requesting to descriptive language, uh, such as commenting or paying attention to the environment. So they could say, I want an apple, but they're not saying, look at that apple tree. So sharing through commenting. How do you feel about things? An opinion 
what you think about observation. This is a really hard area for autistic individuals to find purpose in its use. It is to, the biggest hurdle to overcome in language for autism spectrum children, along with pragmatic language, which is social behavior. So to work on some language issues, you could look at the Autism Language Launcher. That's, there's that book, and I spelled it right this time. Teach me to do it myself. Uh, the Sign and Time DVDs are great with sign language, and it has music, uh, and it also has the words on the screen. So it's kind of a good vocabulary booster. Uh, you could work on speech and occupational therapy. Uh, it can overlap in many areas. It could include feeding and swallowing issues, but also cognition, body posture awareness, and others. Uh, you can contact your health provider on providing service for your child to develop language. By certified, um, that would be an uh, occupational therapist, speech language pathologist, or an uh, applied behavior analysis therapist. Depends on, I think, their age. I'm not sure what the insurance situation is, but I know that a lot of Things are paid for if you have good health insurance for people who are on the spectrum um, or any special needs child for that matter. If they need language development, they can get some therapy through your health provider. Uh, I think some of that changes when they're school age, so you would have to look into that yourself. Um, and then you can always, you know, set aside funds for that too. Okay. All right, so let's look at supporting language development for children with delayed language skills. So we want to create reasons to use language. Functional language, that is, language that has a purpose to your child, will, will more likely motivate their efforts. So use everyday activities. You can place a favorite toy out of reach to ask for it. Take turns opening picture book flaps, talking about it, or showing each other what you found. You can increase the length of response from toy, what he wants you to give him, when he wants you to give him toy, and move to toy, please, can, and then continue on to longer sentences. So you're building on what they know, uh, starting, with what, starting with what they know, and then little by little building on that. Use, uh, use play. Uh, you can incorporate play or a reward. For example, if you're doing a jigsaw with your child, you could give them a piece of the puzzle when they ask for it with eye contact. Or if you're making a child a snack, you could give her a slice of apple after they ask for it. So use those moments to teach. And then you can model language. Model, uh, model speaking and use facial expressions and gestures in front of your child. It also means giving your child an example of what you want him to learn at a level that's right for him. Uh, for example, you could comment on what you're doing, like saying open as you open the car door. You can also comment on what your child is doing. You could say stuck as they try to open a zipper on a Ziploc bag. If your child is trying to say something, you can model the words you think they need, uh, like help as they hold up a packet of food that he can't open. You can also do a video modeling, modeling or use a partner to prompt the child's response. So your partner stands behind the child. They could have a card with the word they need, the phrase they need to speak, if they can read, um, or you can, you know, prompt them. Uh, they, can, they can prompt them while you have a sort of like a conversation. Uh, video modeling is also useful where they can see correct conversation taking place. Uh, if your child is trying to say some, uh, it's best to use the phrases that contain one or two words. So you want uh, one or two words more than your child is currently using. So uh, if they're not yet talking, you want to model one to two word sentences. If they're speaking in two to three word sentences, repeat what they say, but add a couple more words. Again, we're building, to, building up to bigger sentences little by little. And then uh, you can also build skills by practice and targeting those specific skills based on their needs. You could work on a skill like uh, greeting people. They could start with greeting dad with eye contact when he gets home from work. And then the next step could be eye contact and a cuddle. Then eye contact a cuddle and saying hi. You could then work on transferring the school to saying hi when grandma comes to visit. So that way... Um, 
you're generalizing, okay? So generalizing is difficult for some kids. So just because they use it in one situation doesn't mean they'll be able to use it in another. So you want to vary that up with different people, different places, okay? Uh, you can reward your child when he listens, understands or expresses himself. This could be a natural consequence, like giving your child the next piece of a puzzle when they make the request paired with the, the expression, great job asking, or smiling and making a comment to let them know you're interested when they show you a toy. Uh, or example here, thanks for using your words, and give them a hug. And then we've talked about pairing rewards with praise, how it helps develop social language as a reward in and of itself. Awesome job asking for help. All right, I'm going to move on to the sock based reading intervention. Okay, just as a reminder, I think I mentioned this earlier, but um, if your child uh, has dyslexia, it's very important that they have a strong phonics foundation. Sock based reading is not recommended except for words that are unusually difficult to sound out. Okay. So kids, but kids that are unable to learn all those phonics rules, and we know there's a lot of them, uh, but re, uh, learning to read by sight is a way that they can uh, get to a level where they can read uh, books and enjoy them. So I'm going to show you some, first of all, the library books that we have available to talk about, you know, different sight word uh, intervention, early, early in literacy intervention strategies, how to teach this kid is actually a book for kids on the spectrum uh, using uh, visuals and teaching by design uh, is another one that uses visuals. So uh, some children have difficulty learning box because of all those rules. It is difficult to explain these rules to a child that has a cognitive impairment or any kind of language challenge. So you want to start first with uh, this is kind of like the modified reading process. Uh, you want to start first with individual letters, then expand to a combination of letters. You can think of these as the digraphs, blends, word chunks, word families, what works best for you. Uh, and then uh, think of these letter combinations as a picture. This is how your child is going to see it in their mind, hopefully, is a, that form a picture, similar in approach to how Chinese is taught by strokes and symbols. Many children will pick up on the sounds of letters as well and may be able to transition to phonics using the systemic process. So maybe over time they'll say, okay, that first letter in that word always makes that sound and they might actually absorb that and see, see those phonics rules start to evolve. But uh, um, you're, since you want to see the whole words as pictures, that's one, one way to look at it, or you can see it as syllables, blends, and letters. So here's how to get prepared to have all, to be ready to implement this program, okay? First, some of my favorite supplies for this is, in, of course, index card sticky notes, dry erase markers and board or chalk, a pocket wall chart, letter tiles, stamps, magnetic letters, photographs and images that we can match to the words, and then Velcro for those that can be visually seen. Some words will not be able to have a visual. Okay, there's that personalized functional vocabulary list. We're going to draw from their functional vocabulary list that we had have earlier, things that matter to them. Okay, and we're going to start learning the sight words of those. Uh, you want to start out with nouns and action words uh, in a nomenclature style. A nom nomenclature is uh, let's see if I can explain it. It's, it's a three-part word. It can be the picture, it can be the picture with the word, and then just the word. Okay, so that, that's what a nomenclature is. So you're going to kind of graduate that into just words. Uh, noun and action words are best because of course you can, they can learn them initially with a picture. And then 10 to 20 learning words per week with, with an image reinforcement like we talked about. You want to throw in some doke sight words. Those are words that cannot be sounded out. And you can find the doke sight words list. I believe there's 220 on the list. And then create flashcards, two for each word for review work. You can do it uh, 
uh, flashcard style if they're ready for that. Now, I usually introduce one uh, one to one. So I do, uh, I lay out the words out on the table uh, and then I have the matching card and they match it. This is face up, okay, face up. And then they match it, okay. You can also create it into a lotto board, which is sort of like a bingo uh, style memory game, a flashcard style, and then, then it's going to graduate into a booklet format. So here are some great links for free books. Once they get some of those words learned that fit the booklets, you can get these free. There's several free options down here. And I, I probably won't go through all of them, but uh, just to know those resources are available. So all of the Teaching Mama has some. This Reading Mama uh, has free sight word sentence cards. And the Measured Mama of Free Emergent Readers, those are really cute. I've got some good images. Uh, so these are little booklets you can print off. And that will you'll move into once you learn those. And the next page will um, is, again, some more resources. I'm going to let you guys look over these yourself, OK? Uh, but these are the types of resources you can use to help teach uh, sight words. There's all kinds of games. There's all kinds of uh, lottos and bingos. There's uh, sight word card sets. And so these are all going to support the, the, that system. You can look for items like cards, games, and other hands-on practice options. What we want to look for is sight words, vocabulary, basic concepts, beginning sounds and letters, word uh, building, spelling out, because you're going to move from learning sight words into spelling out, and then uh, implement some other uh, basic language skills in with it. Kind of just get them, pull, pull them all in together. Okay, here's, a, uh, again, some more special needs apps. So lots of resources. I, I really wanted to just give you guys a bunch of resources in here. Uh, let, let me go. Now I'm going to do a walkthrough of how you would learn a new word using that site based learning process. So here are three ways to start learning a new word. First, you introduce 10 words to work on for the week. So let's say that we just want to, we just want to limit it to 10 words. You can do 20 later on if you think they can handle it. Uh, but right now we're just going to stick to 10 words. Uh, the, the discrete trial training method of errorless teaching that I mentioned before. So you're going to give them two cards and you're going to type, tap on the correct answer. Okay. Then you're going to move into one-to-one -one correspondence, then expand. And so one-to-one uh, -one correspondence, so that's where you lay out. Everything's upside and they're going to match one-to-one -one the correct word and say it while they're doing it, if you can get them to say it. Uh, and then there's flashcard style. Put them in a pack, put them in a stack, and then flashcard them and see if they remember it. You can also do a matching game. So turn them face down this time, and then match the two pairs and pair them up. Uh, you could do it in a bingo style or a lotto style. They could do go fish or old maid. You can make it a slap game and say, say the word you want them to look for, and then they slap on the right card. Uh, you could write it on dry erase dice, and then they could roll it, say the words that, that comes to the top. Uh, you could try, uh, some more challenges you could try would be read and write the room. Uh, so they go around the room, and uh, you've already put up the sticky notes, okay? And they're going to read it, and then they're going to write it down on their little tablet they're walking around with. And then you could do store-bought games or create your own hands-on learning games. When you're doing the spelling part of it, you're going to take the same 10 cards, okay, and you're going to have them do a different, you can, they could do different things. So uh, they could do tiles. They could do, they could stamp the letters if you have letter stamps. They could, um, let's see, bead, bead, if you have letter beads, you can bead them together. Uh, so uh, there's just all kinds of ways. You can use magnetic letters so, to spell out the words. Uh, and then they can write it. 
you can say the word and they can write it. That's another way they could spell it out. And then uh, the last part is to read it. You're going to expand words into a sentence and then you're going to add it into multiple sentences. So you're using those 10 words, expanding it into a sentence, then multiple sentences, and then you're going to use simple readers or materials that encourage uh, that encourage uh, word. I don't know why that's getting cut off there at the bottom. I apologize for that. I'm not sure why that's getting cut off, but uh, it says you're going to try simple reading or materials that encourage word use, sight, uh, sight word sentence cards that we mentioned before. You could do emergent readers or printable booklets or create your own using those your child's known words and photos and then just build up those sentences, create your own booklets, however you guys, however you want to do it, whatever works for your child. Unit four is tax boxes and busy bags. Okay, this is typically something that's done in the classroom, but I like to create some of these prepared tubs or boxes uh, at home. So I have something to grab to, to, for my child to do during the day that can be beneficial to them, keep him away from, you know, those stemming behaviors and um, just keep his mind focused. So you can create, create these yourself for things that you want them to learn or things that your child enjoys. Uh, and it's just kind of a, a review system too. You can uh, you can use anything you want for the the format. You could use tubs or boxes with materials to learn skills. Uh, you can use busy bags or take a um, let's see or take along activities. You can use binders with zip covers, side loading dry erase pockets, photo albums, uh, baskets. Collect all these things, containers, trays, cookie sheets, um, ashtrays, muffin tin, tins, file folders. There's all kinds of things you can use. And uh, pencil boxes, shoe boxes, file boxes, recipe boxes, tubs. Uh, you can include a visual prompt card like this one that tells you the, stat, the steps. Okay. Uh, it, those step-by-step -step directions included. Uh, and there's all kinds of projects you can make. It could be... Uh, assembly type task so that's that's a good one for learning things that they might want to do out in the workforce uh, push or put in task matching fine motor they could sort they could do close pin task structured play uh, so here's a structured play example uh, adapted games or worksheets and you could use spelling reading math folding pouring uh, vocational based and then uh, you could do the same concept, except in a bag. That way it's great for taking it along. So there's some examples there that would be easy to just throw into a bag and bring with you somewhere. Uh, if you want something quiet, those right there are some good quiet ones for maybe for church. Uh, so there's, and there's all kinds of these options uh, on, online for you to look through. But uh, there's, here's some common supplies I've used, um, pom-poms, magnetic letters and tiles, beads, stickers, shoestrings, laces and yarn, um, Velcro, buttons, containers with lids, clothespins, mini erasers, Play-Doh, math cubes, uh, pop cleaners, Chanel stems, old game parts. I've recycled those and made them into something fun. Old car sets and even adapted some of those games as well and add any other objects that you have on hand. Uh, and then, uh, so there's some more examples. There, there's these books right here have some ideas on those. And then if you go here, all of these uh, have are websites that have task, task boxes. So if you have autism work task, you can look at task boxes here. And these are ones that you can just print out, you know, and create yourself. But uh, that's a pretty expensive option there. Rather than some of these others can get pretty pricey because they come with everything. But, uh, but that is available. 
and all of these have options for that. Uh, there's one using the TEACH program. Uh, these are vocational. So you've got a lot of options here. And also, you can just go to Pinterest. And I don't think I so, and so there's tons and tons of, of ideas that you can implement yourself. The, what, what we want to do here is to teach some independence, okay? So we want to reinforce concepts without the child being, having to depend on someone else. And you can use a schedule or a choice board, remember those, to increase the length of time spent on these on closed-ended activities. And remember, for those open-ended tasks, you want to include that timer. A well-liked task that can be used as a common activity or a way for the child to stay engaged if you're occupied. And then you can encourage your child to come say, I'm done or I need help and other useful language phrases. And, and uh, or to hand you even a PEX card if they're not verbal or a word card to communicate. You can try adapting games to a single player as a task. You could develop and review concepts in math, reading, spelling, life skills, and more using this task system, a choice board or a schedule. Obviously, some of these things you want to do, if you can do it in the natural environment at home, then you want to do it that way. But if you want have some things that need to be reviewed, uh, this would be a great way to do it uh, and get extra reinforcement. An activity to occupy a child to, or incorporate into play choices or a schedule. And then use child's preferences and strengths and work on their challenges gently. So they could do sorting, find motor, puzzles, building, which could be Legos or assembly, matching. Uh, and then, again, you may want to have to go through that process of teaching them to use the timer so they can do any open-ended task. Okay, and then there's incorporating practical life skills. So these are this this is what we want to do when we're since we're at home, great great uh, opportunity to teach things in a natural way, which cannot be learned the same way in a classroom. So uh, this is one of the many benefits of homeschooling a special needs child. Uh, so we've got the option to for the older kids. Uh, I want to start with the older kids because if they can read and write. Uh, they, you can create a list to follow simple directions, and then um, you can also collect everything into a folder or book format, and they could take things along, uh, and then use photographs or pictures to help prompt them for practical life skills. Uh, and this is a, this is a lot easier. It's a lot easier to teach uh, life skills uh, in a natural environment than to try to replicate it artificially. Uh, there are some Montessori-based learning uh, ideas, though, that could be helpful. Um, uh, Montessori has a lot of life skills built in, so for the younger kids, that might be a good way to, in, you know, to encourage them. Uh, create a visual sequence for the steps. You can make it into a task for extra practice, and then add as a daily chore to their schedule. Uh, and so here are some books that you could use uh, that that are of course, practical life skills. Uh, there's the Look and Cook Microwave Cookbook, which is a visual cookbook. So is the I Can Cook. Um, and then it talks, about, here's several resources here that are visual supports for people with autism. Uh, what to do when they leave the nest, uh, how to help them get a job. So all of those life skills are things you want to uh, go over with your child and uh, work with them so that they can be prepared to the level of ability that they can handle. Okay, so here's some things that you can do to start out, just to get some ideas of what we could try. Uh, in the easy column, uh, you could teach them to change out the toilet roll or carry their clothes to the laundry, uh, how to fold um, towels and shirts and pair of socks. Uh, on folding towels and shirts, you could use a spare towel, and if you need to, you can mark it with one fold and then two fold with a with a permanent marker, and then that way they can see where to fold it. Uh, or you can just keep practicing it until they get that ready. And then, of course, paired and socks, you know, they're going to do a matching thing there. Uh, and then open bottles and jars, make the bed, put away groceries, clean up toys and school materials. They could set the table or walk and wash their hands on their own, uh, following steps. Uh, throw, throw trash in trash can, wipe the table, put dishes away, brushing or combing their hair, brushing teeth, 
uh, pouring water to your glass, milk to the cereal, water plants. Uh, and you can try that with objects first. Uh, I know that uh, I've seen a Montessori set where they were practicing pouring, but they're afraid to make a mess, so they use jingle bells um, or they use rocks or beads. So that's a, using things that you have on hand that won't make such a mess uh, and give them a little more encouragement. And then uh, sort and wash the laundry. These are more challenging activities when they're ready to do like sweeping and mopping and making their own snack or microwaving a meal, uh, go on a, a shopping list, tying their shoes, drying dishes, uh, arranging flowers, uh, understand how to spend money, understand how to follow time. So uh, the, depending on the level of your child, those are some life skills that would be uh, important to learn and easy to teach in the natural environment. Okay. This is our last unit, okay? We're going to talk about behavior management and stress relief. So uh, if you use boards to show child when their task is replete, completed, then reward, they could do what we talked about before, which is the first thin system, or you could do a token system. Uh, or some of those others that we mentioned before. can They're not just for doing schedules, they're also for doing uh, tasks that can help them um, complete, the, complete the task in a, in a social way so that uh, they can calm down. So if you stay aware, uh, keep up data on what causes episodes. Okay, this is that ABC again. If you see down here, we talked about this earlier, the ABC is a behavior. There is a cause for every behavior. It could be an antecedent. It could be what happened before the behavior. It could be the behavior, the undesired behavior, okay? They're using it because they're not able to cope with the situation, okay? They're doing it. Uh, consequence, what happens after? They're anticipating what could happen so that's what's causing the behavior. So sometimes schedules can help with that because if they know what's happening next, then they're calm, they're calmer because they're not stressing out about something they don't know is going to happen uh, about the future. So uh, here are ways to keep data on what causes behavior. You can tally the behavior amount per day. You can replace, divert, and direct. Tally again to see if there is a change in the amount of episodes to know if strategy is working. You can pay attention to sensory issues. Watch for nonverbal cues to intervene before the behavior begins. And then avoid overstimulation. Okay, so if there is a change in the amount of episodes to know if a strategy is working. Um, I wanted to make sure you understood about tallying. So here's a tally marker. Okay. If you um, you want those numbers to go down over the course of time, so you want to see if that, that intervening behavior is going to work. So uh, basically you're just going to collect data on that and then uh, see what works. Um, try different, you know, try one approach for a while before you change it out, but hopefully you'll get some, um, some decrease in the behavior and uh, avoid that overstimulation that's causing the behavior. So um, uh, there are some different books on that, uh, library books, and all of these talk about how to deal with uh, social skills and behavior issues. So I encourage you to look at those. Uh, some kids, if they're good, if they're really strong readers, uh, they might like the social skills picture book um, or um, See, I put that on there twice. There's a there's one for high school and there's one for uh, younger kids that's uh, more visual. So uh, I think this one is actually social skills book, and uh, so it's more sentence based. But uh, you can um, sometimes it helps for them just to have that written out for them. Uh, the new social story book I know has a little bit of both. It has a picture on one side and then it has a sentence explanation of how to deal with social situations. And then um, there's, let's see, 
different solutions you can use. Uh, I think Social Skills Solutions uses more of a, I want to say, uh, the board's the board's solutions. So all of those things can help work with those behaviors. And then let me give you a few co some common ideas. We've talked about the visual boards here. So look, when I'm upset, and then here are the options they could use. They could go for a walk. Uh, they could uh, get a drink, or I can listen to music. Um, I could do a puzzle. So these are things to help distract them, okay? Count to 10, do a breathing exercise. They could do, you could say, I'm at it. they could hold you a stoplight saying, okay, I need a break kind of thing. Uh, Self-regulating pyramid or thermometer. Here's that thermometer thing again. So that if they can tell you, hey, I'm at a four, I am almost at a five, then we got to do something different. Uh, you can distract them with something, another task. They could choose a green choice and mark off the red choice. Uh, they could move to a preferred task, go to a sensory area to calm down, uh, listen to music, take a walk, get a drink of water, uh, go to a sensory activity. This could you could they could ask for a, a massage or a chewy toy or blow some bubbles. Uh, they, a weighted vest. Some some kids respond well to pressure. Uh, and our weight, um, fine motor work like beads, cutting and tracing, uh, even heavy work like pushing, pulling, climbing, jumping, cleaning, carrying, swinging, spinning, running, dancing, essential oils. Uh, sometimes certain smells can help people calm. Uh, I think lavender is one that helps relax people. Uh, exercise with yoga moves or stretches. So the exercise is, is kind of distracting them but it's also uh, maybe helping them feel better. Maybe they just needed that. Uh, you could break up schoolwork with favorite activities, time breaks, play and relaxation, bath time or water play. You could keep child's uh, space. It, it helps to keep their space organized too because it just makes them feel uh, more calm. Uh, and then follow routine. All those things are helpful to keep a child uh, calm. Uh, behavior tips, remember to be patient and realistic of what your child can handle and be consistent with how you handle uh, the behavior issues. If, uh, you can manage change and transition times, support effective communication. So um, maybe they need a visual to help them communicate to you. I know that uh, when my son gets really upset, his language barrier, his language just falls apart. So you got to find another way to find out uh, what's what's bothering them. Uh, so uh, some of the things uh, we've tried is just letting him have a time to calm down. And then later on, okay, let's see what the issue was. And then evaluate what was going on around the time, like we talked about before, the, the ABC. Okay, what happened before and what happened? What's he thinking he's not going to get to do or doesn't want to do? Uh, identify the behavior's purpose. What is he trying to do with the behavior? Is he, are they mad? Are they hurt? Uh, or um, are they just not, are they ang angry about something they don't want to do or wanting something they can't think of the name? So help identify those emotions using that stress skill or those social stories. You can reward and praise. Negative consequence, take away favorite item using visual timer to demonstrate how long. You could try video modeling with the partner using a correct behavior. And then replace an unwanted behavior with a more appropriate one for the age of the child. So something similar in movement, something similar in emotion. So, and we talked about that earlier. Stomp their foot instead of hitting their hand, um, hitting something. Okay, and uh, just to go over some things with you guys, I do appreciate you guys holding out on me. Uh, I know that sometimes I get a little wrong-winded, but uh, you probably have many more questions I haven't answered. But as we're wrapping up, I want to remind you that our Homeschool Resources webpage at the library has additional ideas 
And I hope that these uh, teaching tips and techniques can help you. Uh, many children improve over time in behavior and life skills naturally with the encouragement and persistence. Developmental milestones and cognitive and language areas can also improve. Uh, try not to get discouraged if you reach a roadblock and progress seems at a standstill. Sometimes a child doesn't reach an ability limit. Uh, 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 sometimes a child can reach an ability limit, I'm sorry. But take heart knowing that you have tried your best. Achieving any level of independence helps your child and your family manage life better together. It's enough for your child to know that they are loved. All in-person homeschooling events have been canceled for the fall semester, but you're welcome to contact me at the library, and I will try my best to guide you and give you any information I can. Thank you guys for attending.